My name is Laura Holmes Haddad, and I am a stage four inflammatory breast cancer survivor. It is because of the precision medicine that I received at UCSF that I am alive today. The reason that I celebrated my 40th birthday and the reason that I can watch my two kids grow up. When standard chemotherapy protocols at a regional cancer center failed, my only hope was a clinical trial. My oncologist at the Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center used his research and knowledge and in consultation with Dr. Alan Ashworth, concluded that my BRCA2 mutation and tumor profile would likely respond to a PARP inhibitor. The trial regimen shrunk my tumor in six months and I became a surgical candidate. I came through with clear margins and have been NED since May 2015. I take every opportunity to share my story and highlight the cutting edge approach to cancer care that UCSF provides. Informing young adult cancer patients about new cancer treatments and the importance of comprehensive cancer centers has become my life's work. So I am delighted to be here and introduce Dr. Boris Bastian and Dr. Michael Korn, who are doing such important work for oncology patients. I will start by introducing Dr. Boris Bastian. He received his MD degree from the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. After completing a residency in dermatology at the University of Würzburg, he received additional training in dermatopathology and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco, before joining the institution's faculty and starting his research, research laboratory at UCSF's Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. In 2010, he moved to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to become chairman of the Department of Pathology. He served as the president of the Society of Melanoma Research from 2010 to 2013. In 2011, he returned to UCSF and holds the title of Gerson and Barbara Baker Distinguished Professor of Cancer Biology. He founded and directs the Clinical Cancer Genomics Laboratory at UCSF, which performs molecular diagnostics for patients of the Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. He has clinical responsibilities in the dermat dermatopathology section of the Departments of Dermatology and Pathology, where he also oversees the Molecular Diagnostic Laboratory of the Dermatopathology section. Dr. Bastian's research laboratory focuses on the molecular genetics of cutaneous neoplasms, with a particular emphasis on the discovery of genetic alterations useful for, diagno for diagnosis, classification, and therapy. His laboratory has contributed to the discovery of multiple genetic alterations in melanocytic neoplasia that are relevant for therapeutic and diagnostic purposes, and he has established a taxonomy of melanocytic neoplasia that integrates <laughs> molecular and clinical disease aspects. Whew. He, <laughs> he has received numerous awards for his work. Now to Dr. Michael Korn. He received his medical doctorate from Heinrich Hein University in Dusseldorf, Germany. He completed his training in internal medicine and medical oncology at the University of Essen, Germany, where he also began his scientific work on understanding the molecular underpinnings of cancer. After a postdoctoral fellowship with Frank McCormick at UCSF, he joined the faculty in 2001. He is attending physician in gastroenterology and medical oncology and an expert on upper GI cancers. He is a member of the NCCN guidelines panel and the NCI task force for these cancers. His laboratory work and clinical research focuses on rational design of combination therapies for gastrointestinal cancers. Dr. Korn leads the Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center Molecular Oncology Initiative and chairs the UCSF Molecular Tumor Board with the goal of integrating precision oncology approaches into clinical care and research at UCSF. His scientific work has been published in leading medical journals. And with that, doctors.
Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. So we are going to do this presentation together. I'm going to start, and then we're going to do some back and forth explaining or um, showing you some uh, examples of what we're trying to do uh, helps patients. So kind of the field of medicine is evolving very rapidly from um, an era that one may call uh, intuitive medicine, really the art of medicine, probably a very personalized approach to medicine where doctors really um, uh, solve medical problems through intuitive experimentation, pattern recognition, and um, this has moved to an evidence-based form of medicine where we have a more data-driven approach. We have clinical trials um, in cancer with large cohorts of patients that are treated with a specific therapy, and then we learn that this specific therapy, for example, works in 60% of patients, and this is then used for approval of these medicines. And kind of the, the problem of dealing with this information as a patient as well as a physician is one doesn't really know whether the patient in front of you is uh, in the 60% of possible responders or the 40% of non-responders. And so kind of the, the, the next iteration, the hope, and aspiration of medicine is to, to move to an era of precision medicine where one can actually um, extract um, in, from the patient's disease certain markers that are predictive uh, of the response, whether they are in the 60 or in the 40 percent. And that's kind of the term precision medicine. I mean, you, you hear this used for, uh, for in, in various terms, but uh, I prefer this more specific uh, usage where it's about obtaining a measurement that helps with predicting uh, a response or, or formulating a, a diagnosis. And uh, the history of medicine has taught us that um, this works the better, the, uh, the, the more we understand the pathophysiology of a given disease. If we understand the mechanism uh, of, of what causes a specific disease, we have the best chance to actually successfully intervene. And so the best predictive markers are those that actually get at the root cause of the disease. And a, a powerful example or illustration of this paradigm is uh, the, the development in infectious diseases. You can see kind of a timeline here. This was the major plague of, uh, literally, of, of mankind until probably the uh, beginning of last century. Uh, and you can see the, the major progresses here entailed uh, actually visualizing the organism through, through the development of the microscope, uh, developing the first vaccine approaches, uh, developing hygiene approaches to reduce infections, and, and really understand the connection between certain diseases and an organism that causes these diseases. So that was mainly Pasteur who, who showed this. But we see this whole uh, development here over those centuries culminated with the discovery of penicillin, which, if you want, was uh, maybe the first targeted therapy because it's really directed directly at the, the root cause of an infectious disease. And cancer tries to follow that paradigm to really uh, learn, uh, understand the specific causes of the disease and then uh, hit the, the disease at the root cause. And so, um, and this is now, especially since uh, maybe the uh, discovery that uh, specific genetic alterations cause a specific form of leukemia, namely chronic myeloid leukemia, where there is a translocation as two chromosomes are broken and stitched together in the wrong way that generate at the stitch point a fusion uh, gene that is basically composed of one gene at the, at the head and another at the tail that now is constitutively active driving cells to divide, where then a drug was developed that specifically inhibits this fusion protein, and that revolutionized the care of this specific type of, of um, 
leukemia, and I think that led to the, uh, this cover of the Times, uh, or the Time magazine here, um, that there is. Well, what year was that? Well, what year was that? Late in the late 90s, right? Well, 2000. I think. 2000. I mean, the, but the, I mean, this, this is an interesting question really to illustrate how long it actually takes to translate basic discoveries into action as shown here because the underlying genetic alteration, the so-called Philadelphia chromosome, because the, the tiny chromosome that was formed by this misalignment of two chromosomes was observed in the 60s, but it was kind of just recognized as a marker of disease, not really bearing any clue as the root cause of this disease. And it, then the gene at the junction had to be cloned. And then it had to be understood that this is a kinase, an enzyme that can actually be inhibited. Now these iterations go a lot faster, but they still take too long. But uh, so the, the process you know, that culminated with really the development of this uh, drug started 40 years earlier. Um, so and here is an, an example uh, how this transformed melanoma treatment. So in melanoma, a mutation was discovered in a gene called BRAF, uh, and that activates it. And here is a patient who has many metastases in this PET scan who, who has a, a, a BRAF mutation in his or her melanoma and um, treated with a specific inhibitor um, against BRAF, and this is a scan uh, 15 days later, and uh, it, it's really remarkable, the result. Unfortunately, to, to, for full disclosure, uh, if I don't know about this specific patient, but the typical history is if you take the scan again after three months, the tumors come back because they now have found a way around this. And now the standard of care is actually to combine this drug with another drug uh, to decrease the likelihood that they find this way around it. Um, but this is a poster child of, of targeted therapy in melanoma, which was kind of the, probably the, the worst cancer of all, of all before no oncologist wanted to even deal with it because it was not responding to any therapy. And look at this. And so now we, as a field, have, have gained tremendous insights on how cancers arise. We know that they uh, arise through mutations in the DNA that create heritable alterations in cells that can be passed on from a dividing cell to its daughter cells. And as they divide, the daughter cells acquire additional mutations, and they're basically under uh, selective pressure, obeying to Darwin's principles that the, the fittest cells, and, and here fit is, is, is obviously a negative attribute for the host in, which, in whom this is happening, uh, really uh, um, uh, divides uh, faster and, and gets the overhand. And, and this process of uh, slow accumulation of mutations ultimately leads to a cell that is now completely transformed and, and constitutes uh, a cancerous state. And we've been studying this in the lab, uh, trying to, to learn how a mole turns into uh, a melanoma. And we basically delineated the, the mutations that start the process, which mutations follow, and then what has to happen to ultimately cause the melanoma. And so learning this which can lead to an, an algorithm that can tell you when you're looking at such a lesion, is this still benign? Is this malignant? I, uh, as you heard, I'm a dermatopathologist, so I look through the microscope and make decisions of whether uh, something's benign or not. And uh, I and my colleagues sometimes just don't know uh, by just looking at it. And so resorting to additional information in, under the moniker of precision medicine, we uh, hope, and we're partly actually employing this already in the clinic, learning of how this, this uh, genetic information can help with, with making the call how far a lesion has evolved. Yes? Um, the genetic mutations, these are just random background cosmic ray type mutations, or these are because of metabolic 
imbalances in the host body? Or? It, it depends on which disease you're looking at. In the, co in the case of melanoma, in particular, melanomas on the sun exposed skin, like all the other skin cancers that are so common in, in California, they're caused by uh, ultraviolet radiation. Uh, but it's a completely random process where the, uh, the uh, radiation mutates randomly the, the DNA in cells, uh, but this happens all over the body and uh, it's basically a lottery that is, is taking place. And at some point, something like BRAF, as I showed you earlier, is actually uh, mutated and that is sufficient, we believe, to, to form this. And then these, all these cells in this neoplasm now have the BRAF mutation, and so they look like this. They have the blue mutation, and they are now continuously exposed to UV radiation, and they can now have a chance to win a second time in the lottery, and then you have a cell that then can undergo uh, another round of division, and now you have two of the maybe necessary four mutations in one and the same cell. And this is how we think most cancers arise, by slow accumulation of, of mutations. Are those mutations due to genetics? Well, the, we call, the, the mutations are in the DNA, uh, but they are we acquired during the life of the patient. So they're not inherited. Um, uh, but there are obviously predisposing inherited mutations for melanoma. It's mainly just having that skin color is uh, a significant risk because uh, if you have less melanin, uh, you, you basically have less endogenous uh, sunscreen, right? So, uh, but uh, no, these are acquired mutations. They're not inherited. So the hope is uh, that for cancers, here it's shown as a kind of mixed bag of things that we so far catalog, categorized, uh, classify based on microscopic, microscopic features, clinical um, um, features, which organ they arise, that we can actually classify them also by genetics where we have, can distinguish various genetic states. As I was showing in the pictures before, we have a state where it's just one mutation, one where we have two, and another where we have three, and that may then uh, basically uh, constitute the fully evolved state. And then we can then distinguish different tumor types. Some of them have a benign counterpart, like that mole that I showed. Some of them do not. Some of them have an intermediate. Uh, state where something is borderline and so that the pathologists who actually struggle with diagnosing something are not just struggling because uh, um, they, they're, they, they don't know what they're doing, but in fact it's actually an intermediate state and we can, uh, for melanoma, we've demonstrated that this actually exists, such an intermediate state. And so this is kind of uh, the hope that we can develop a molecular taxonomy of all tumors, that we can use genetic information to uh, determine how far a given tumor type has evolved, but we can also use it to, uh, to determine what tumor type are we actually looking at. Because at some of the examples that we show and that we've seen by testing patient samples, we sometimes see that the genetic results actually contradict the diagnosis that we think the patient has this type of cancer and then we look at the genetic alterations and say, no, this is something completely different. And that obviously dramatically changes the management. So this is a picture showing the mutation burden, meaning the number of mutations uh, per million letters in the DNA for the most common types of cancers. And you may not be able to read this here, but the, the, the cancers here have a very high mutation burden. You can see melanoma is at the top, and as I indicated before, the, mel the mutations in melanoma have a very specific signature. You can actually tell that they were caused by UV uh, radiation because UV makes a very specific type of typographical error, if you want, in the DNA. Whereas we have also lung cancers up here and these uh, lung cancers have another uh, 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 signature, typically one of uh, tobacco smoke and so on. And then we have certain cancers that are, have a very low mutation burden. We now know that this mutation burden, the number of mutations that are present in the genome of a cancer, is highly predictive of response 
to immunotherapy. Uh, that's in the other room, the session. Um, but, and that is the case because all these mutations make the cells look more foreign so that the uh, immune system can actually recognize them as, as foreign and the immunotherapies basically uh, facilitate this. And so the approach that we are taking to uh, extract this type of information and use it to help with diagnosis and also help with identifying the best possible therapy for a, a, a given patient is to extract DNA from the tumor and we also take the normal DNA from the patient and we then uh, basically shred the DNA in little pieces of like 200 letters and then we put it on a sequencing machine and get millions of uh, reads from each of these um, samples. And we, we then compare the uh, genetic information from the tumor to the genetic information of the normal. Then we can actually see what is uh, what it has happened in the tumor, uh, because this will be mutations that will be only present in this sample, but not here. We occasionally also find mutations in the normal sample where we can actually see this patient has a, uh, I didn't know about your uh, BRCA2 mutation, and it actually happens that we have an example of that, but we would find that in this sample uh, and because we're only looking, we're also looking just at the normal uh, tumor, so we, uh, a normal tissue, so we can uh, distinguish whether a mutation is inherited present in all the cells of the body or whether it's something that specifically happened in the tumor. And those, the, the, the latter ones uh, are the ones that we are particularly interested in when we're choosing therapies because obviously knowing a specific alteration in the tumor will allow us to target just that and leave the rest of the other cells alone. And so this is uh, for you to peruse. The, uh, the <laughs> UCSF 500 cancer panel, so it has about 500 genes that we sequence in their entirety, and then there are some red genes where we also sequence some additional bits because these genes are part of these kind of translocations that I was describing where things are broken apart and stitched together the wrong way, and so we have some uh, that we can analyze there. When, is it, Yes, please. Um, 500 is a very small subset of the total number of genes on the DNA. How, how did you particular? How, how were those that particular 500 selected? Yeah, so there is more than 20,000 genes in the genome, but far less than a thousand are. Uh, involved in cancer, as we know. So we now, basically, from the uh, sequencing efforts uh, uh, that, that are underway, uh, where hundreds of diff diff uh, patient samples from different cancer types have been cataloged, where all the genes have been sequenced, we basically picked the ones that are recurrently altered in, in cancers. But you're correct, we may miss some, but we, we update this panel periodically, or we constantly uh, canvass the literature and say, oh, we have to add this gene because somebody has described this to occur in, in this rare type of, of tumor. But that's how the, the 500 were selected. Basically, we reached out to all our clinicians and said, we were gonna do this, send us all your genes on your wish list, and we went through the literature and, and to the databases and picked genes that are frequently mutated in cancer. But this is a moving target. Okay. So, um, as Boris introduced you into kind of the principles here already, from a clinician's perspective, um, we have essentially a big dream here. Can you get closer to the Yes. Um, the big dream is that uh, we want to be at some point uh, in a position that we can analyze uh, a patient's tumor in great detail. Boris talked about DNA sequencing, but there might be other methods that go um, after other properties that cancer cells have. There is our RNA sequencing. We might be looking into um, how uh, proteins are uh, found in uh, a particular patient's cancer. And the idea is to put together this uh, picture of the tumor, how it looks like in a given patient who we see in our clinic.
And then to <clears throat> uh, come up with an individualized treatment concept that really focuses in a specific way on these findings that we made in these patients. Similar to what you saw in terms of the uh, targeting the BRAF mutation. Now we have, we're at a point that we have many, many drugs that do similar things, targeting different types of mutations that occur in various types of cancer. And the idea is to uh, then follow what happens in the patient who is treated in this precise fashion. And actually, um, as Boris mentioned, not infrequently, tumors learn, because cancer is very smart, how to deal with these targeted therapies. And the cancer cells will find ways around it and escape. These escape mechanisms are not totally random. In certain ways, sometimes we can predict how they look like, and we can start actually looking for these changes by then analyzing what is happening in the patient who is on treatment with these targeted therapies, and then essentially uh, form this kind of iterative cycle where we would go back and forth between treatment, analyzing what happens, redesigning treatment, and so on and so forth. This is actually not, on, not totally science fiction at the moment because, uh, for example, in uh, lung cancer treatment, this is becoming reality because in certain subtypes of lung cancer, we know what kind of mutations will occur when we treat those tumors with targeted therapies. But the reality is that this is a very difficult task. And um, the difficulty arises from multiple uh, sources. And I just want to highlight a couple of very important ones. As we just saw on the previous slides, um, most cancers don't have just one mutation or a few. No, the reality is they have tens or hundreds. Or in some cases, like in colon cancer, in certain types of colon cancer, there are thousands of mutations present in a given cancer cell. So the question is, how do you, out of all these uh, alterations, how do you pick the one that you actually want to treat in a meaningful way? The other problem, and this is an area my uh, laboratory has worked on now for a long time, is the fact that cancer cells um, and the way cancer cells function is not a static thing. It's not like a switch watch where the gears are in particular places and they don't change. Unfortunately, these are very dynamic systems. So when you uh, treat with some of these targeted agents, what might happen immediately in the cell, not even a learning process necessary, certain defense mechanisms kick in that allow the cell to survive. And we have uh, shown this in, in, in various ways, especially in relationship to a very important pathway called the MAP kinase pathway, where we found if we treat one key protein in there, and that should actually kill the cell, what happens is it fires a feedback loop that activates a survival pathway, and actually nothing happens. We built combination therapies based on that to kind of block the escape route. And that seems to work to some extent, and we ran clinical trials based on that where we saw responses in patients uh, with difficult to treat diagnosis like pancreatic cancer. But you can imagine, this is just one example, um, dif different mutations, different escape rounds, different uh, defense mechanisms that the cancer cells have. And lastly, just to make it a little bit more complicated, currently there are at least 1,000 drugs in, in development worldwide for cancer indications. Sometimes there are multiple drugs being developed to hit the same target. They all have different properties. They all will behave differently when the patient is treated. So how do you pick the one treatment that you will then eventually give to the patient. To start addressing this complexity in a more systematic fashion, um, we have formed uh, here at UCSF uh, a molecular tumor board where we uh, brought together um, a very broad spectrum of experts. Being at UCSF comes with the advantage that we can tap into all these very smart minds that work in these different areas. So we brought together P. 
people f who represent cancer genomics, uh, biologists, uh, and right next to them sit patients who actually develop clinical trials, who run phase one clinical trials, very early uh, trials with new drugs. Um, obviously, we have representatives of these different uh, 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 organ sites that we are treating, if it is breast cancer or colorectal cancer and so on. And then, uh, very most importantly also to put it into a bigger uh, uh, context, we have genetic counselors who help us understand when we find changes in the germline, in the normal DNA of a patient using the uses of 500 test. Does this potentially have implications not only for this one patient, but maybe for the entire family of the patient? Um, so this group of people uh, meets on a weekly basis, and essentially every um, case report that is generated um, on the sequencing results on this UCSF 500 test um, gets then uh, presented at the tumor board. And we all um, essentially stick our heads together. We use uh, knowledge bases, we, uh, databases that have uh, already, uh, they, they have uh, some uh, body of information that we can tap into that teaches us about uh, previous experiences with certain drugs in certain circumstances. And all this is uh, trying to put, uh, we, we put this together, and at the end we come up with one recommendation for this one patient. But um, you can imagine, um, this is uh, not easy, bringing all these people together at an institution like this. Um, so the American uh, expression would be herding cats. Uh, <laughs> the German expression is herding fleas, <laughs> which is probably more descriptive. <laughs> And um, so uh, in order to just help at this technical level, bringing people together, we have now developed a, a computational infrastructure that um, we actually will begin using very soon, which we call a virtual molecular tumor board. And what that allows is we will see uh, the results of this molecular test, but at the same time we get automatic information about the patient, all the information that we have in our electronic medical record will be joined with this information, and that information is being made available to all these panel members. And they can look at this in an, wherever they are uh, and then comment on this very much like a Facebook type of situation. But this one is focused on each and e of these patients. And the advantage of doing this in a computerized context is that we now can start capturing the information. We actually put the recommendations, the discussions in a database. And so what happens is we, will, we are setting up a process where we continuously learn from our experiences. And that learned information will inform the discussion of the next patient. So, um, uh, we thought now to give you a little bit more clear idea of what the problems are we're dealing with, we show you a couple of case examples. They are also representative of essentially four different outcomes that we currently get from this type of molecular testing of a patient's tumor. One is, as we discussed now quite a bit, we want to find treatments that we can use in a very targeted fashion. The second one is, as we mentioned, we frequently find uh, changes in the normal DNA, so there is this whole genetic aspect. Can we learn something about the, uh, the patient's family's DNA that is relevant for that patient and their family? The third aspect is that um, we um, sometimes have patients who we treat with a pretty standard treatment, and they have an uh, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, response um, to um, this kind of treatment that is unusual. So we can go back and analyze th the patient's DNA, and sometimes we get hints why that worked, which makes us hopefully smarter the next time. And lastly, very important from the pathologist's perspective, it turns out sometimes this analysis changes the diagnosis, something we thought we'd pretty half down at this point, but it turns out the molecular information sometimes teaches us that the d initial diagnosis was wrong, and that obviously has sometimes 
uh, uh, very substantial clinical um, consequences. So the first case is a young child, nine months old, that presented to our um, uh, pediatric uh, hematology clinic and was found to have a um, rare form of leukemia. And so Boris's group did a UCSF 500 analysis on the child's uh, DNA. Yes, yeah, so you can see the, this is actually a recent case here. Uh, and uh, the nine month old had this very large uh, tummy because he had a giant spleen that was full of leukemic cells. and. Um, he um, did the sequencing on the tumor cells and found this, um, you know, the, all these little gray bars here are the little bits of DNA. I told you we shred the DNA and we'll sequence it and read them. And then we line it up uh, to the actual normal human genome sequence. And all these little bars here are individual uh, uh, reads. You can't see the letters uh, here. It's just gray means it's a perfect match. And if it's color, that actually means that one end of this read maps somewhere else where it sh it, it's not supposed to map. And you can see all these colored ones uh, pile up over here. And that indicates to us that there is such a gene fusion I was talking about with this other type of, of uh, chronic myeloid leukemia that gives rise to the Philadelphia chromosome. In this type of uh, um, uh, Leukemia, this is actually a very unusual result, uh, a, a fusion in, involving a gene called FLT3. And it, it activates it very similar to the other type of leukemia. And there's, it happens, actually, that there are drugs that are approved for other indications that hit molecules that are similar to this uh, FLT3, in this case, actually, a RAF inhibitor like one, the first one that was supposed to inhibit BRAF, but it didn't do so very well, but it actually inhibits FLT3 very well. And you can see here is the, the boy's white cell count. So uh, he had his spleen removed here, but he continued to progress, uh, became more and more leukemic, uh, then uh, was uh, treated and then relapsed. Uh, and that was here when we got the result. And then he was treated with this drug, sorafenib, you can see he had a complete response. Within days, he uh, uh, was in, in complete remission. And this is actually a picture from the, the mom said, and she allowed us to show this here to you. Uh, and there was another one where he's at the beach. And, and Dr. Stieglitz pointed out that this is uh, um, uh, quite remarkable because he had only, uh, 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 he didn't need any transfusion anymore because he had bone marrow failure before um, and um, didn't need to get any chemotherapy where usually these children are, hosp are hospitalized for months. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's, it's a, a very significant success. Uh, and, and I think really highlights what we just discussed a minute ago about this availability of these thousands of drugs and their different properties. This drug was developed to hit the uh, melanoma gene BRAF, as Boris mentioned. Turns out it hits various other genes. And so here we're using a uh, non-intended property of a drug to great advantage. And that kind of highlights this part of the complexity. You know, we might sometimes have drugs that we typically don't use for a certain disease that we can essentially borrow when we find things like that. So we have one more minute, they say. Um, so the next um, um, uh, example is um, what, we, uh, what we also told you about, that sometimes we find changes that is completely changed the diagnosis of a patient. So in this case, this was a young man with a huge uh, tumor in his pelvis. It was thought to be a Ewing sarcoma, which should typically respond very well to chemotherapy. But in this case, there was no response. Instead, the patient had daily high fevers, wasted away, was bedridden, couldn't get out of bed anymore because it was so weak. And um, the UCSF 500 test was done, which, reviewed, which revealed um, a fusion, which is typically found in a disease. It's an unusual, actually not so malignant tumor. It's called angiomatoid histiocytoma. 
uh, which is mostly an inflammatory tumor. And uh, so based on that, the, uh, the team started the patient on a specific drug that inhibits one of the factors that's produced by this tumor that causes this wasting syndrome. And within days, the patient, uh, uh, over our uh, status improved, he gained weight. His fever stopped immediately, and about three weeks later, he was able to go home. And six months later, he was able to undergo then resection of this tumor. And that it tells you what major consequences can arise just from changing the diagnosis based on molecular findings. Um, maybe in the interest of time, we skip this uh, case. And please. Question about the last case. So when you mm -hmm. looked at the pathology, uh, or whoever looked at the pathologist looked at at the tumor, they didn't see under the microscope that it wasn't the Ewing sarcoma? Well, the Ewing sarcoma there, it has overlapping uh, uh, histology with many other cancers. So they call all these small round cell tumors, and they're, they're uh, difficult to distinguish. So usually molecular markers are already used for this, and they do a specific genetic test that looks for, again, a fusion event, but it's not uh, sophisticated enough to really uh, detect what is actually fused to the gene that is known to be fused in, in a whole bunch of different uh, sarcomas. So, Yes, the, I mean, the sarcoma uh, diagnosis is problematic and, and was probably with the, with the um, uh, hematological diseases one of the first where molecular diagnostics were introduced. But there were, th this is basically a new generation of molecular diagnostics that gives more precise, more detailed information that was able to allow us to, as you say, this is a very specific alteration that is known only to occur in this type of histiocytoma. So the, the Yes, so, uh, we'll maybe do this very briefly, uh, but it's fascinating to see. Um, this is one of my patients uh, who presented with uh, advanced esophageal cancer. He actually didn't respond to chemotherapy, which is a standard therapy. Presented to the hospital two years ago with fluid around his heart, and it, and they were, it turns out there were cancer cells in that fluid. When that happens, this is unfortunately a very, very bad sign. And, people typically pass away within weeks after this is found. I mean, in a desperate move, I switched him to a different kind of chemotherapy. And um, before I did this, in the, the, uh, the, the uh, cover around the heart was surgically opened to allow the fluid to, to get out. And after treat starting this treatment, within a few days, he started improving. About six weeks later, after I started him, it was like watching someone recovering from an infectious disease, to be honest. When someone has pneumonia, that's how they recover when the antibiotics work. And uh, the f uh, about three months later, uh, a CT scan showed no evidence of disease. Mm -hmm. And the patient is still alive. He flies his dad's airplane, uh, that's his hobby. And um, so the question was, in this case, I was actually expecting I need to find some other treatment for him. So we ran this UCSF 500 test. And we found this mutation, uh, which is a mutation in a DNA repair gene. And this mutation, uh, I mean, I'll just summarize quickly, leads to hundreds or thousands of mutations as a consequence in a patient's tumor. And this is why we will, uh, know now that immune therapy frequently works. Well, we belong, this patient had never received immune therapy. But what I believe happened in his case is he autoimmunized. Because we opened up his heart, his cells were exposed in, in a broad fashion, there's a very good chance that it actually triggered an immune response against that tumor. I can't prove it, but it's very provocative. Mm -hmm. So overall, when we look at this, this kind of uh, approach that we're taking results in what we call actionable uh, mutations that we find in about 45% uh, of the patients. In 18%, we find these uh, mutations in normal DNA that tell us about inherited diseases. That's a large, large number of patients. And lastly, we've changed the diagnosis in 7%, which is much more than we ever uh, thought. So what we are now doing is we put this all this information together. We're building expert systems to help us guide this into the future. And we're actually participating in nat national organizations, or will participate, that will help us to pool all this information and learn even more. 
uh, for the benefit of our patients. So um, how about uh, you f uh, f finish up with our where we would like to take this into the, in the future? Well, I think you, you have that you, 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 yeah. you, I think we, we can, we can yeah. open it for discussion, yes. I think. And just uh, leave it on. Uh, yeah. Lots of work to do. <laughs> Uh, but we'd be happy to entertain any questions. Can I read a couple of questions? I know we're running short. Will the UCSF Virtual Tumor Board be only for UCSF patients, or is this a resource that will be offered also for patients who aren't being treated in other medical centers? I think it's a very good question. We actually have started reaching out to physicians in the uh, community. And we have now a mechanism in place that outside oncologists can submit their own cases, and we can review that. So we w this is kind of at the beginning, but the virtual tumor board will be part of that in the future. And this is related to the molecular tumor board. What is the time from when a patient is identified for the molecular tumor board to the time the patient is presented a treatment plan, and who communicates this to the patient? That's a very good question. Uh, so the greatest delay is uh, actually re arises from frequently for us finding the samples. It might be at an outside hospital. Then the analysis is being done. That takes about three to four weeks. Um, and then the patient gets listed for molecular tumor board discussion. That takes typically about two weeks until they're, they're being discussed. And when we um, the way we typically do this is that the treating physician is actually present at the tumor board meeting. So they will learn firsthand what the recommendation is. We are also producing essentially a report uh, of this recommendation that ends up in the electronic medical record. So every physician within UCSF can actually see that. You compared precision medicine to intuitive medicine, which is highly trained and expensive. How is preci precision medicine any less highly trained and expensive so that it is both better and more accessible? <laughs> <laughs> well, I s uh, skipped the, uh, over a little uh, uh, piece of information in there. Um, the cost of treating infection uh, has continued to drop over the last century uh, by about five to 10% a year. So, um, so there is, this is basically used by uh, health econ economists like Clay uh, Christensen who, who uh, wrote this, this, or from whom I got this slide, to, to make the point that if we can algorithmatize diagnoses, we make them a lot cheaper. At the moment, uh, this is not cheap, what we're doing, it's poorly, if at all, reimbursed by insurance companies because it's kind of the bleeding edge of, of medicine. And, and it requires a lot of manual uh, work of, of people, although we have built a computing platform in the cloud that basically takes all these puzzle pieces and assembles them and, and, and pr generates lists. Then there's a, a bunch of us uh, molecular pathologists, some of them listed up here, um, <clears throat> that have to pour through this information and, and generate a report which takes one to two hours and then we have to discuss it. So it's not cheap yet. Yet. But we hope with the information, uh, as was Michael, uh, Michael was describing, of the integration of information here at our institution with other centers that we can actually uh, further automize that and really provide a very quick result that uh, uh, will bring down the costs. So clearly there is precedent that this it makes economic sense. At the moment it's an added expense and it's an added expense that actually uh, doesn't have a good solution to be paid for at the moment. We have time for one more. Um, do, you, do you do a genetic DNA analysis of all cancer patients who are treated at UCSF? And if not, why not? Hmm. Well, the answer is um, clearly not. Um, we are currently analyzing a relatively small fraction of patients. Uh, we select them based on clinical need urgent, and urgency. Um, we would very much love to expand this, but uh, as Boris mentioned, um, currently this is 
not really reimbursed by health insurance or only to a very small level. So actually, is, uh, uh, the uh, university provides quite a bit of financial supplementation to make this happen. Um, the goal is, and that's the way we look at it, at some point, every patient who is diagnosed with cancer should have a chance to know about the genetic makeup of their cancer and their inherited DNA. That concludes our session. Thank you so much to Dr. Korn and Dr. Bastian.